Good morning, hi, hello. This comes to you directly from Rochdale. Um, in the new tradition that apparently I'm doing now, where I film in different rooms, this is not my room, but it is another location, and we're upstairs. Ooh, you're creeping closer. Um, so third time's the charm. I'll unpack that for you. So last night I was awfully close, close to the edge. I'm not, sorry, someone just texted me. Um, I was awfully close to the edge um, <laughs> because of... I mean, relatively speaking, it doesn't really matter, but I think it was that end of the day kind of thing where I'd filmed this video once and then the camera decided to uh, not record, which I only realised at the end of it after I'd done this dead good spiel with loads of academic referencing. It's not true. Um, so then I filmed it again, thinking, ah, you'll not get me. And um, yeah, that was fine. And then I had to tag a bit on the end, uploaded it to edit in, to edit the, splice the two bits together, as it were. And then um, one of the files went missing. So it's just like, oh, I'm done with this. So I made a cup of tea, as I've got one now. Mm. Big old pint pot of tea. And um, I um, I thought, I'm going to bed, me. I I'm done with this. So I did. I went to bed. And that were it. Reader, watcher, viewer, listener. Mm. Um, but anyway, it's a new dawn. It's a new day. It's a new life for me. And I'm feeling fair to middling. Um, <laughs> no, I'm okay. Um with all that said, um, that gives you a little bit of context for this um, for this review. Um, welcome back to the library's open. Now, I hope you brought your library card because it's getting daft, this. Rules is rules at the end of the day. Get your library card and keep your hands clean. Um, originally, this was going to be a one book video, but now it's going to be two, only because of the things that I discussed previously, for one. And for two, I also realised that they're quite... Oh, sunlight, sunset... That's not the words. Um, a little shaft of, can we appreciate that light? She's a model. Um, yeah, I also um, realised that um, the two kind of complement one another in quite an interesting way. In um, in terms of uh, themes and ideas and so on and so forth. So I decided to put them together. Um, which will become clear as we go along, hopefully. So I've spent about you know, roughly half the time on each. So the first book I want to talk about for the third time is uh, one that um, a few of you recommended to me and I'm really, really glad you did because I had a ball reading it. I did so a ball. And, and it's this little beauty here. <coughs> Beyond Black by uh, Hilary Mantle. Mantel. Mantle. Hilary Mantlepiece. Let's go with that. Mantlepiece with knickknacks. Um which is um i got i think i got it for about 249 i don't say the prices of things by the way to be um like weird about prices because me but you know we're all in a difficult position financially at the moment the world is um and um you know i just sort of mention it to say you know if you shop around a little bit online you can get uh pretty cheap versions uh now i'd never met I'd never read any Hillary Mantelpiece before, um, but on the strength of this, which I did really enjoy, I have managed to track down um, the first two parts of a um, Thomas Cromwell trilogy, for which she won uh, the Man Booker twice for uh, both books, which is pretty much unheard of for concurrent books. Um, so, me nan, bless her, who is currently self-isolating, um, had a copy of the second book, Bring Up the Bodies, um, which um, she'd said to me previously, oh, I can't get on with it. I don't really, I feel like I've come in halfway through. Transpires, she's not read the first one, so that's why Elaine. And um, randomly, as I was having a little bit of a tidy, um, I found that I had the first one, Wolf, Wolf Hall. I got for like 50p from a jumble or something. Um, so I've got those now, and although I won't be reading them straight away, because as you'll have noticed from my hauls and stuff, hauls, um, I've got a lot to plow through uh, during this period, but I will get to them at some point. But yeah, so the main points, um, well, I'll just very quickly pray see the plot. First, I was a bit unsure about the cover because I was like, does that really re reflect what the book's about? But actually, with hindsight, having gone through it, actually, it's perfect cover. Um, what edition is this anyway? So obviously, this would have been the original edition. Uh, this edition is 2013, but it actually came out originally in 2005, so it's 15 years old now. Because I was a bit bemused at first by this, um, 
but then again I do like pants and I enjoy kicking so that's good for me and actually having this sort of bright surface with the little creepy bits of uh, black around the edges sort of perfectly describes what this book is so a pricey of the plot it's about a medium a psychic medium called Alison Hart not her real name that's not a spoiler you find that out and it's about her relationship uh, with um, a woman called Colette who is first her assistant then her roommate and then sort of becomes her manager and they have quite a fractious relationship as uh, she's sort of left her marriage to this quite useless um, guy called Gavin although kind of sweet in some ways um, and it's about their sort of life together and there's also these characters that she calls the fiends who are one of whom is her spirit guide Morris who's a right nerd well and um, the fiends are all in spirit but they're people that Alison remembers from her past because we get a lot of flashbacks to her growing up uh, with their mother who was a sex worker and there's some quite um, it's quite near to the knuckle things as a warning about um, these characters sort of uh, criminal activity violence and also some really dodgy stuff about Alison being like a nine ten year old girl and you know there's the inference that they were she was bought and sold basically to these people um, What's interesting and what I wanted to bring up and also why I wanted to double bill it with the next book is that it's really interestingly formatted with loads of skill because at first you think, oh, this is really sort of episodic in terms of they go, they do this, they go here, blah, blah, blah. There's one bit where they move to a new house and then she meets um, a homeless man and so on and so forth. And there's various characters, other mediums or sensitives as they're described in the book come into it and they do things like hen nights or things like that but actually what you realize about three quarters of the way through is that oh the plot's been unfolding all the way along and i just haven't noticed it's not episodic at all it's all been building up to something well i mean it can be both episodic and part of a longer narrative um that's tv um but um yeah, she sort of lulls you with this really gentle, meandering writing style that doesn't feel annoying, by the way. It's just pleasant. Um, and then you go, oh, it was all part of the whole. And then when you think back to events that happened, you're like, that's why that was there, and so on and so forth. So that's a lot of skill, I think, for, for Hilary Mantle as an author. Um, <clears throat> picking up on that idea of the structuring of it, it's... It's very clever because, as I say, there's some pretty horrific stuff in here in terms of uh, violence and inappropriate uh, behaviours, so on and so forth. And um, what um, what Hilary Mantle manages to do is put this really sort of gentle but not childlike style of storytelling in, so it almost simultaneously subsumes the, hor the horror and heightens it. I'd liken that to sort of um, something we talk about a lot in acting and also in also in writing for performance. I know I always mention my job, but it is perma permanent, <laughs> Freudian slip. I should be so lucky. It is pertinent um, in the sense that opposing styles or emotions often work really well together and heighten one another. So, for instance, if you're writing about tragedy using a comedic style, or a relaxed style to meet it actually makes it both go like that. I suppose that the nearest comparison would be like the colour wheel, you know, in colour theory. So like um, complementary colours uh, heighten one another. That makes sense. Um, so actually, you know, the, de the, the deepest tragedy can also be the blackest comedy and, and most element most contain elements of both that make them feel uh, very real and very immediate. And um, yeah, that's what she does with this. Um, one thing my, my old acting teacher when I was at drama school used to say was, if you think something as a character, the opposite is probably even more true. So I suppose that's, um, that's pretty much saying the same thing, isn't it? So for instance, if you hate someone, uh, you probably love them a little bit as well because people don't put energy into hating things that they don't care about um and i'm not saying that need be traditional love in the sense that i hate you know um the the um sorry i just went a bit blank there i hate um you know the uh 
you know the subjugation of of working class people by you know the wealthy elite sort of thing um and that's not because i love them that's because i passionately believe that their wealth should be distributed so what they have is maybe what i love because of what it could do for other people um so yeah beyond black is really really interesting it's very cleverly plotted beautifully nuanced in the sense that we we learn the rules if there's one thing i hate it's exposition over the top and sort of you know here's the story here's what happens blah 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 blah, blah. um and in a way it's very difficult when world making because this world very much feels like our our world point five so a sort of world adjacent to ours if you will slightly heightened um but there's never any um these are the rules of mediumship this is how the spirit world works it sort of emerges as it needs to um which is which is lovely and um you know you really sort of feel for the characters which is odd because there's no first person narrative or anything but at times there were points where because they're pretty horrible to each other i'm not gonna lie and um, colette and alison in particular colette's horrible to alison and there were parts where i was really indignant on alison's behalf i was just like oi you i was saying in my head to alison i was like whack her in the face with a mackerel you um, not a mackerel because I'm vegan, a big firm bit of tofu and get her told and then um, you know if you can get that kind of reaction from you know a sort of jaded, I'm not jaded, maybe I am, reader and uh, get them to invest in your characters to that level Um I think that um, you know well done Hilary Mantel, I can see why you won the man booker uh, so yeah, thank you so much for that recommendation. Loved this, really, really enjoyed it. it took me about four days because I had quite a lot of work on, but if you've got like quite a lot of time spare, which I mean probably a lot of us have at the moment, if you're not um, if you're not working from home, or you just want to relax, the pages turn themselves. It's um, it's uh, it's a really good read, and I definitely would recommend. So recommend me more things because I trust you now. I'll just pause there because I'm a dodgy battery, and I'll be back to discuss the second book. I'm back, it's me. I'm at a slightly different angle because I've had to plug in as I go along um, because uh, the battery was dead low. It was blinking at me like this. That didn't happen, um, but it was low. Um, <laughs> so the second book I wanted to talk about, and I sort of read this on a slight overlap with Beyond Black, was uh, this one, which is a non-fiction, which I mentioned in my isolation haul part one. Uh, a... Um, to the day when I went garden. Well, well, when you see this, it'll be it. To the day for me when you see this, you know. And this is a, a non-fiction called "Will Store the Science of Storytelling." Now I bought this because um, I wanted to. This is a new one, actually. Uh, it's the paperback edition, obviously. Um, and I got this primarily for work as a teaching tool. Um, what's quite gratifying is a lot of the stuff in it. I kind of sort of knew anyway but in different terms so that was good I was like I mm, hope I've not been teaching the wrong things um, and um, I haven't which is great um, <laughs> but um, this is a sort of a discussion about well as the as as the title says the science of storytelling so Will Store sort of goes into detail about how uh, plotting I mean he mentions both fiction and also um, you know, performance writing, so films and so on and so forth, about how they work on our um, subconscious or how they work to speak to the way that we operate as people and how our brains work to process information and make decisions. Um, it's it's very, very interesting because there's a sort of, at first you sort of come in with like um, stuff about, um, you know, neural imaging and so on and so forth uh, and you're like oh is this going to be a bit too scientifically dense but it's not it's really lyrical and very sort of um approachable almost gossipy um in 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 a way that manages to sort of educate as well as entertain um so he um he's, he sort of starts off by saying how the the roots of writing as we all know start in storytelling you know leading back to the year dot and um one of the things he says in the introduction which i really enjoyed was we experience our day-to-day -day lives in story mode our brain creates a world for us to live in and populates it with allies and villains 
and then he sort of unpacks that as we go along and talks about like development of the self and how we view ourselves what kind of person we are and how that instructs how um, we behave in situations and he sort of uses us as in me the person as standing for character and then explains how knowing that knowing that allows us to analyse characters in both fiction and film. Um, so he starts off with the idea of um, most sort of good engaging writing starts with an element of change, so immediately upsetting a status quo, the status quo you discover later on, but this is the upset and I love the examples he uses because one of them is um, where's Papa going with that axe, which is from Charlotte's Web. So immediately we're in a state of flux. But he also contrasts it, that with uh, that spot. He hasn't eaten his supper. Where can he be? So the spot book's by Eric Hill. And what's really lovely about that is that it's not patronising about children's literature either. In the sense that um, they all follow, all literature kind of follows a, roughly the same pattern. Whether you realise you're doing it or not. Which is something I realised when I started thinking about my own practice. And going, oh yeah, do you do that? I just wouldn't have called it that, but it's really interesting to know what that terminology is. Um, I'm just looking through here because I've turned loads of pages down. I know, sacrilege, but there were things I just wanted to talk about. Um, so here's an interesting passage that I really enjoyed. He talks a lot about how we construct reality um, as in the story of our lives. Um, he says, we do know that actual reality is radically different than the model of it that we experience in our heads. For instance, there is no sound out there. If a tree falls in a forest and there's no one to hear it, it creates changes in air pressure and vibrations in the ground. The crash is an effect that happens in the brain. Um, and then he talks about there being no colour there because atoms are colourless. So, um, and he, um, he talks about the fact that colour can be a lie. Uh, based on experience that we trained our brains into because we only have like three cones in our eye I think as opposed to like is it bees or um, Yeah Bees eyes for instance can see the electromagnetic structure of the sky uh, Mantis shrimp have 16 cones in their eyes to discern color and shape and stuff and I just thought that's so interesting isn't it because <clears throat> Even these sort of really basics well, what we take to be basics about knowing abstract shapes or what things look like are actually learned behaviours based on tricks that the brain creates to survive. So obviously that's talking about how um, when we look at characters' behaviour and how they conceptualise the world, we have to sort of do it at one remove, going their experience is crafted as ours is and what they see may not be what we see and perceive. Um, <clears throat> It's good. He, he sort of moves on. There's five sections, four sections, sorry, in the book. Um, yeah, um, where one is about world making, which is obviously the process of creating the world of the fiction. Second is about the flawed self. Um, so that's both people and character. Uh, the dramatic question, which is about sort of fleshing out how we use in writing dialogue, situation, so on and so forth to, to add... I don't know, I suppose, weight and shape to those flawed self-characters. And finally, uh, there's one about um, plots, endings and meanings, so sort of ultimate meanings and whether they, you know, dating back to myth and legend and so on and so forth, whether they have anything to say about, um, uh, uh, you know, the whole sort of experience of both reading and living. As you'll know, as I've discussed on this channel before, we all, we're all aware that you know, there's something in common with everyone who reads and enjoys stories or not even enjoys, consumes stories because they're so important. And if, if we conceptualise our lives as a story, then there's really no escape in it. And it's that whole thing dating back to, um, you know, the year dot, as they say, where every culture has similar stories. Um, and there must be a reason for that because they weren't in communication to go, Oh, here's this story, here's this story. So whether that was passed through sort of travellers or, you know, or, or whether there is some sort of basic human need, which I do believe for certain types of stories. Because um, he sort of talks a lot about hero narrative as well, which is something I teach about the, um, is it Joseph Campbell, I think, who writes about the monomyth, which is talking about 
basically the basic shape of all stories, um, particularly quest stories and so on and so forth, where there's 16 points that all um, those type of stories. And even the majority of non-traditionally questy, mythy stories follow, which sort of speaks to me is that there's a sort of human need for them, I think. Um, when we talk in class about them, I talk about um, story as catharsis, um, story as uh, modelling behaviour and story as an opportunity to, um, I suppose, a form of intrusive thought in a way in that it allows you to rehearse scenarios. Uh, it's also about community building. It's about teaching. Um, we need stories so sometimes so we don't make mistakes um, through misinformation and so on and so forth. <clears throat> A couple of other things I wanted to just bring up. Um, ah, yes, this is this sort of exemplifies that in when he talks about the flawed self. He says, um, "It's not just that what we do in the large scale narratives of our lives, love, career, friendships. Um, it's not just that what we do. Uh, it tends to be somewhat consistent over time with us often repeating the same kinds of triumph or mistake. Rather, what we do in tiny interactions, like the way we shop, dress, or talk to strangers on the train, or even decorate the house, shows the same kind of patterns. So I suppose that he's talking about character informed by both head story and story experienced through listening or reading, and that sort of macro big behaviours are mirrored in small behaviours which speak to sort of character development. Um, one really interesting thing as well is um, as a as a vegan you um, I found this particularly interesting because we talk a lot about cognitive dissonance with um, veganism and um, we think about um, um, you know, how people are able to hold two opposing viewpoints in their head at once. So, I love animals, I eat animals, which are not compatible at all, in my opinion. Um, and we talk about cognitive dissonance, people being able to separate two opposing thoughts. Uh, but what he says here is, um, them, from being model builders, so creators of our own world, we become model defenders. The flawed self with its flawed model of the world has been constructed and the brain starts to protect it. So when, it when we encounter evidence that it might be wrong because other people aren't perceiving the world as we do, we can find it deeply disturbing. Rather than changing its models by acknowledging the perspectives of these people, our brains seek to deny them. So they create this idea that whoever opposes us is the villain of our story. And um, diametrically sort of, I thought I was going to hiccup then, but I wasn't, um, diametrically opposed to what we hold dear and sacred. So I think that's really, really interesting. Um, absolutely would recommend this. It's so easy to read while not stimping on being um, sort of psychologically in depth and treating the reader with both intelligence, but also without trying to blind them with science. So very interesting. And the reason I chose to pair that with uh, Beyond Black was what I said before about narrative structures and so on and so forth. How, um, you know, uh, the fiction writer can break those rules of the you know traditional story setup and also trick us um, and um, force us to assimilate information through opposing tragedy and comedy or through a very gentle style that masks the hideousness um bubbling under the surface so i actually thought there were some really interesting connections there and of course everybody in beyond black is very much a flawed character um as are we all um so there's some definite crossover there i feel and they actually complemented each other really well um so happy accident there um, so yeah, that's it for this episode. That was uh, Beyond Black, Hilary Mantle Peace, Hilary Mantle, and Will Store, The Science of Storytelling. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. I do quite like these two two books per episode um, uh, episodes. Uh, let me know if you do or if you don't. Um, and um, keep sending those recommendations in and... Uh, if you've read any of these, give us your thoughts. It's really nice to read your comments. I really like this little community that we've built, particularly in these difficult times. And, um, you know, it's just a small way we can support each other and, and reach out that hand to one another. Um, so, yeah, uh, please do be in touch. Put that library card safe. Disinfect it first. Uh, make yourself a big cup of tea and, and get reading. 
Um, I hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week, and I will see you in the very next episode. Mm -hmm. Lots of love.